you know, it may end up just being a nice spring rain. This is spring. Uh, this is Alabama. We're used to a little bit of sprinkle every day. So uh, again, I'm glad you could come out this morning and spend a little bit of, bit of time together. Again, looking at your order of, of worship this morning, uh, some things uh, in advance to uh, make you aware of. Wednesday, uh, of course, we don't have a church Wednesday because the kids are out of school. It's a spring break. And uh, again, hoping families enjoy that time together with their kids. Uh, Wednesday, 10 a.m., Vietnam Veterans Day Memorial Service at the Memorial Park. Uh, bring your own chair. And uh, they do have some chairs set up more and more over the time, but, but it's best if you just bring your own chair if you'd like to, uh, to participate uh, in that. Also then, uh, everything else is delineated there for you. On the back, April 2nd through the 8th, that's Palm Sunday, next time we meet, which is also communion, but we're going to start prayer week, and we're going to spend a week of prayer praying for the lost, and uh, have little verses to meditate on, and just pray in our world needs to get saved. Men, women, and children. So we're going to just concentrate that during Easter week. As you know, Easter week is a time in which folks only go to church once a year. We need to pray that they'll go again this year and, uh, and come out and hear the message one, one more time. Hopefully God gives us that one more time. So that's what we're going to make that week. And Kathy's worked on that. We'll have some more information next Sunday to put in your Bible. We're going to meet in some homes. It's going to be at 6.30, we decide, 6.30. Uh, so some homes have opened up. Wednesday, we normally have a service, and we have a service that night, so we'll do it at that, uh, at our Wednesday night uh, time together. And then Thursday's Monday, Thursday, we'll have a special communion service here, like I always do at 6.30 for Monday, Thursday, and we'll talk about that verse in our prayer list then. So there'll be a whole list in there uh, next week. And again, uh, notice about Monday, Thursday there. Everything else listed, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, coming down to April 15th is the Walk of Life at the Loxley Park. All those materials are in the back if you'd like to sign up or get sponsored or see Karen uh, about raises money for Women's Care Medical Center. So uh, again, if you'd like to participate in that. Then April, August, April 23rd is our quarterly meeting and we're also using the luncheon then as a camp fundraiser uh, for camp. We've got a camp secured thanks to Bree, I think, is in charge of that this year. We've got a camp secured. And kids have been asking about it for, you know, this is post-COVID. Finally, camp again. So uh, they're excited about that. So be praying about that. And, and uh, if you want to come participate in that uh, fundraiser, and also it's our quarterly meeting. Uh, annual meeting on uh, Safety Harbor, Florida, April 27th to the 29th. Again, if you're not too late to get you in, if you'd like to be a delegate, I just got to run it by the council and, uh, and get it approved for that and get you in to, uh, to represent uh, the church in that way. It will be online uh, as well as you can go in person. Okay, remember the blessing table each week. Donations can be placed on the table or in the library. A uh, new edition of the home altar. Again, the home altar is written for folks throughout our entire denomination. They get asked to do a, a week of devotions, uh, and they're kind of assigned the litany. This is the, the, the normal litany of the church, the prayer reading uh, passages uh, for these, uh, these weeks. And so you'll meet all kinds of people as you read these throughout the covenant churches, your fellow covenanters. And uh, so if you're looking for a devotional guide to keep you in the Word of God, they're free. Take them. That's what we get them for to, to put, them, put them to work. Um, Pastor Bob Simmons, you can listen in uh, on WHEP uh, at uh, 815 on Sunday mornings or at 9, uh, or on 92.5 FM. Uh, and he's going to 20 years in that broadcasting. Uh, again, silence your cell phones. I uh, had prayer requests come in uh, last night. Uh, you need to uh, pray. For uh, Mississippi, and of course, a Mount Bayou Covenant Church, Walk of Faith Covenant Church. Many of you uh, have met Pastor Daryl Johnson. He's been here. Uh, he's the pastor of that church there in Mississippi. It is about 80 miles north of Rolling Fork. Rolling Fork is the town that disappeared. The tornadoes took it completely out. So he's kind of ground zero for a lot of the relief efforts the Covenant World Relief is going to do. Uh, when they decide what all they're going to do as far as helping that town. And I've got a, an address there, too, for the, the council. But pray for him right now. The main thing is pray uh, about what they can do and what they should do uh, as far as uh, relief there. Compassion Ministry, it's called out of Greenville, Mississippi. They'll be setting up to, to do distribution. Uh, also, I didn't know if, if you knew, I noted I passed it along in our uh, other classes, but uh, they had a fire at uh, I forget, Venice, Florida. I'm trying to think of the name of the church now. Bay. Indies Covenant Church. Uh, they were meeting in a uh, Harbor House 
It's a 65 plus kind of community uh, with uh, mostly RVers that are there, but where they were meeting, uh, burnt. They also lost everything, their church office, <coughs> in those pews and PA systems and all that too. So lots of things going on, and yet here we get to be this morning, out of the weather, in this beautiful place. So there's lots to be, uh, lots to be thankful for this morning as, as well. So, as always, if I missed any announcements, things I forgot. Oh, things I did forget. Uh, I keep forgetting to mention these things. In the back of your pews are these little welcome cards. And, of course, that's for anybody visiting us to help us uh, know. But there's also a place for prayer requests on there. If you have a prayer concern and you want to get it to me and uh, to our prayer folks, please uh, fill that out. And, uh, and if a uh, visitation request, if you'd like a visit from the pastor or an appointment to see him, please fill that out and put that in the uh, box in the back, the offering box, and we can put those uh, to work. Okay. Got to be something else on this. All right, seeing no hands, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lots to pray about this morning, lots to be thankful for, lots of folks in need this morning. Let's go to the Lord and let us pray. your order of worship this morning. Our memory verse, this is our last Sunday. And again, Psalm 11963 is a great verse to memorize. If somebody asks you, well, what in the world is a covenant church? You know, which sometimes isn't easy. Sometimes I think the word Christianity has been used today. You know, you're, you're better off saying, you know, well, well, you know, well, I'm a covenant church. And they have no idea what that means. But that gives you an opportunity then to explain to them what a covenant is. Well, the mission friends used to define themselves with this verse. But I am a friend. What I am is I'm a friend to all those who fear God, to all who follow His, his precepts. That's what I am. I'm a mission friend. So it's on for Solomon. And then you can kind of build from there. What I like when I first came down here, and people, when I said that, you know, the covenant church, covenant church, covenant church. Oh, oh yeah, the covenant church. It's kind of like a Baptist church, isn't it? <laughs> Nothing against the Baptists. It's just everything is measured with that premium. You know, there, that's how everything else is kind of, kind of valued and measured. No, not not. Really, yeah, kind of, but no, so we're kind of fit uh, in that way. But there's a good verse to know to, uh, to tell them what it means to be a mission. Okay? So if you say that reverence with me before and after the last time this month, Psalm 119, 63. 
I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. Psalms 119, 63. Then if you would take your hymnal to page 346. A call to worship entitled, uh, This is Love. This is Love, 346. And if you back up uh, one, two, two pages back, you'll see Amazing Grace, page 343. Rock of Ages at the top of the page, but it's 342, 343 there. Amazing Grace. Oh, great hymn of the faith. So if you've got 346 and your finger's stuck in 343, and if you can and are able to this morning, you can stand with me. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And thank you, Father, for your great love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Thank you, Those are just the stanzas that made it in the American 
in the American church is the most popular. Uh, they've been selected for us. Again, this morning, look at our scripture reading, 100, Psalm 130. There's four verses this morning in the reading and the litany in the church for this day. Psalm 130, verses 1 through 4. And there we read, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. God bless the reading of his word. Please stand as we sing number 635 in the garden. <coughs>
our prayers. A lot of folks, dear Lord, out of no church buildings this morning. Fires and tornadoes and hurt folks, dear Father, all over here within our own area. Again, we remember them this morning. What a privilege it is that we have just to come here to gather, to hear this music, dear Lord, to sing these old hymns of the faith, to renew ourselves in these things. Again, Father, I pray we don't take times like this for granted, dear Lord. We cherish every moment of what time that we have to spend like this as your children come that sit before you as brothers and sisters, dear Lord, and to, to pray, to, to look into your world. And again, I think with this being Holy Week coming up with Palm Sunday and churches and special services all over our land and throughout the world, dear Lord, again, people would come to you, would bow their hearts, open their ears and their eyes, dear Lord, to see your truth, and then folks would get saved. So again, we pray that for our world, for a revival, for a, a working of your Holy Spirit in the lives of families, dear Lord, men, women, and children. We admit, dear Lord, these things are just too big for us. So without you, we can't do nothing. And so we invoke you this morning, thanking you, praising you, worshiping your amazing grace, dear Lord, and who you are, and requesting, dear Father, your help in this mission to make disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, our children, we have children this morning and their teacher for their lesson this morning. Now last Lord's Day we studied a special day, Sabbath foundational passage and a gateway to the law and to the rest of Scripture. Now we come to Adam and Eve, our first parents. The creation and institution of the first family. Dr. John Davis titled his commentary on the book of Genesis Paradise to Prison. Paradise to Prison. I mean, to put it in perspective, Genesis in just 50 chapters takes us from paradise, Adam and Eve in the garden. We talked about walking and talking about in the garden with God this morning and saying like that. But Adam and Eve in the garden of God, it jumps to Joseph in prison, wrongly convicted of rape. Mankind from paradise to worldly Egypt, it's corrupt politics and idolatry and sin in 50 chapters. Think about it. From paradise to a prison institution in Egypt in which criminals and sinners are housed, Joseph being one of those. This is the story of the consequences of sin. The story of the consequences of the first family's choices. Choices apart from trust and obedience to God and to His Word. Is there a lesson there? I mean, what don't we get about that? And what don't we get about choices? Choices. So we are introduced to the rest of Scripture here in this story. How, how are we going to fix this? God's plan of salvation, the coming of the seed, and a new creation by the Holy Spirit of God. There are some things here that we need to learn about God ourselves, about sin about being responsible for our choices. I'm going to preach it now. Right? Our lives tend to, tend to end up being uh, uh, the sum total of the choices that we have made. When I preach things like that, I realize we're getting a little close to home. God, who gave man a perfect environment, paradise, a free will, a choice, didn't make him a robot or a slave. And yet God gets blamed for all of man's lousy choices. Think about it. How many times have I heard as a pastor of the years, why does God allow that? He didn't. He said no. He said don't do that. Come out from among them and be separate. That's what he said. And then when it happens, we blame God. Why did God allow my boyfriend to become a heroin addict and beat me up? God 
didn't do that. Your boyfriend did because he made some bad choices. And maybe you made some wrong choices not seeking the will of God when you hooked up with your boyfriend. <coughs> and you blame God. Imagine. God gave us a perfect environment and in the end, who gets blamed for all problems? The mess that we make. God. You wonder why he doesn't wipe us all out. That's amazing grace. Amazing, amazing grace. I'm not going to read verses 4 through 24 right now. I'm going to take it apart and read it as I go because of the sake of time this morning. But I want you to take it and go back and read it for yourselves. That's my hope, my desire. It's what you find in those verses, okay, when you go back and put it all together. I can only, only take it about. Let me look at verses 4 through 7 and talk about man. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. This portion of Scripture on man, verses 4 through 7, continue the account of what became of the heavens and the earth when or in the day they were created. What happened to it? You know, that question might be, well, what became of creation? In fact, as we look around today at it, we may say, what happened? Well, what happened is, as we're going to read about a little bit later, when we go on with the story of the fall, but we can't, don't have time to do that this morning, sin entered the world and devastated it all. From paradise to prison and slavery in just 50 chapters. There are answers to questions here like, why is the world such a mess? Why are people such a mess? Why am I such a mess? In the creation of Adam, we see a stark contrast to begin with. The backdrop of time when there was no life, no growth, no rain, and no one to till the ground. God took great care in forming a very good place for man to dwell and to fellowship with creators we looked at last week. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. No shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. I'll stop right there. Some commentary point out this is maybe a prequel to the disobedience that's going to follow and a flood that's going to wash them all away, but at this time it hadn't rained on the earth yet. And there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. God prepared a beautiful place that was very good for man. Israel under Moses, Genesis first readers would know that her Lord had created everything and that he had formed mankind by a special design. The work of the Lord had created human life in both, both fashioning from the dust and in breathing the breath of God. The word formed here in the Hebrew describes the work of an artist, like a potter shaping an earthen vessel from clay. So God formed or sculpted man from the clay. And of course, that's a symbol that is used throughout Scripture. And if you're here this morning and you're His child, God is shaping you, transforming you, molding you into the very image of His Son by the Word, by the Spirit, if your life is moldable, yielded to God, my favorite word, yield, an active, passive verb. You run, you jump, you fly, you yield. You actively do nothing but let God have His way with you. Man made by divine, by plan. Man made from the earth. He is earthy. The Hebrew word for man, for Adam, is related to the word for ground or clay, Adam. So, if somebody says, your name is mud, they're pretty close to the truth, you know. They're not that, they're not that far off. God breathed in the breath of life into man, transformed him into a living, being a living soul. This made man a spiritual being with a capacity for serving and fellowship and communicating with God. Walking with the Lord, we sang about in the garden this morning. To walk with Him, to talk with Him along the way. With this perfect and beautiful creation and sculpting of man in mind, we should be able to clearly see the contrast 
by the damage that is going to be done by the fall. That little three-letter word starts with an S, ends with an E. Sin. Don't preach much about sin nowadays. A broken world full of broken men and women who need to be saved. Since the fall, forgiveness and regeneration by the inbreathing of the Holy Spirit is essential in order for people to once again fellowship with God. Ye must be born again by the Spirit. Now in the covenant church, we have five affirmations. Our second affirmation is the necessity of the new birth. You must be born again. The first two affirmations is, is, is the centrality of the Word of God. Man isn't to live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Man created a spiritual being, now broken, carnal, fleshly, blind, and in trespasses of sin. Jesus said in Genesis, John 3, Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water, springs of water, right, that God made for Adam. And the Spirit, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised if I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases and you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You must be born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any was in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passing away. The new is here. Man in Christ Jesus is a new creation being transformed, being sculpted, being molded into the very image of Jesus Christ. That image that was messed up by sin. Secondly, let's talk about this garden. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there He put the man that He had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye, good for fruit. In the middle of the garden there was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden Flowed, there, uh, flowed from there, it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first was Pish Pishon, and the winds through the entire, it went through the entire land of Havilah, uh, where there was gold. The gold of the land is good, aromatic, resin, onyx also is there. The name of the second river was Gihon, its winds, uh, it winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, it runs to the east side of Asher. And the fourth river was the Euphrates River, as we hear about over and over again. Mankind was placed in this perfect setting. A garden specially prepared for him. You might say he had a perfect environment to thrive in. The description of the garden, the trees, the river in it, leads to the command, man could enjoy it all. It's all yours. But you must not eat from the one. The one forbidden tree. Among those trees in the garden was one that produced life, the tree of life. Another that produced knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or at least eating from it did, we don't know. This knowledge, I believe, was experiential, good and evil. Good and evil would be experienced by man if the forbidden fruit were eaten. Man, instead of God, would decide for himself what is good and evil. You're going to let God decide what's good and evil? Or are you going to decide what's good and evil? That warfare goes on right down to this day. How does that work out? I mean, how does it work out in our own lives when we play little gods and decide what is good and evil instead of just obeying God's word and trusting? How does that work out? Does anybody consult God or His word anymore about what they should do? and not do. A book that is neglected, not read, not read. Like I've been in some pretty scary Bible studies in which the Bible was there, but it wasn't ever used. And a dozen folks sat around in a circle talking about their problems, and what was the solution to those problems was whatever the group decided. Well, we think you should do this. Well, I think maybe, oh yeah, maybe we should do that too. But what does the Bible say? What did God say? Not, not really consulted. Do you think maybe Israel under Moses, by the law, were being taught a lesson by this story? 
Who decides what is good and evil? Man or God? And what happens when it's left to man to decide good and evil? The potential for disaster was great. If man in self-confident pride is humorous, overstepped his bounds, and attempted to live life on his own apart from God's word, leading to every man doing that which was right in his own eyes. Proverbs 2.2, 2, Proverbs 14.12, Judges 2.25. The tree of life, on the other hand, was apparently a means of preserving and promoting life for Adam and Eve in the garden. These trees were in the middle of the garden, apparently close to each other. They provided the basis for the testing to come. Every time Adam and Eve walked by the tree of knowledge of good and evil and chose not to eat of it, because of what God said, they were obeying God's words. Choose. In the dedicate, they kind of pick up on this and they tell us to choose the way of life or the way of death. It's up to you. You choose. Choose. It's two ways. Question. Do you let God decide for you what is good and what is evil? Or do you decide for yourself apart from what God says, says in His Word? The trees in verse 9, the river in verse 10, the precious gold in the gems in verses 11 and 12 in the garden. We also see in the, the new earth in its eternal state that we studied in Revelation 21, verses 10 and 11, 21, 21, and, and chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Indicating that paradise, Eden, the land, will be restored in the new earth, the new Eden. The promised land, Beulah land, is where you enter by faith and fellowship with God, worshiping and obeying Him in love. Now, for Israel, the lesson may be this, lest you get thrown out. You walk and talk with God and obey Him and walk with Him, or you're going to get thrown out the land. So don't be like them. Don't be like Adam and Eve. Rather, obey God's commands. Not rocket science. These verses in Genesis 2, 8 through 14 describe the richness of the then known world. The garden probably in the area of the Persian Gulf, we don't know for sure, judging from the place names in these verses, if the geography of that area was the same after the flood, and there's no guarantee it was, it might have been totally changed because of the flood, but mentions of the Tigris and the Euphrates River, it sounds very similar to the boundaries that God would give Abraham for the promised land in Genesis 15, 18. Israel would enter the promised land by faith under Joshua, being told that if they obey the blessings and the cursings, they would be blessed in the land. If they disobey, they're going to get thrown out. In fact, the story repeats itself. I mean, does that sound familiar? Kind of like what happened to their first parents, Adam and Eve. Like I told you, I had a great history professor when I was at Grace and he opened his class. The one thing, we only learn one thing from history. And that is we don't learn anything from history. We don't. For a great discussion on the land and the garden, there's a great book, Genesis Unbound, by John Salehammer, for those that you want to uh, dig in further. Responsibilities, verses 15 through 17. The Lord God took the man. Now he have choices. He has responsibilities. You know, we have that real problem in our world today. In a lot of counseling, people don't take responsibility for their choices. They blame others, just like when you see after the garden. And they don't do their responsibilities. And they accept responsibility for nothing. That has its roots in Genesis, which is foundational for the rest of the Bible. Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden, to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Man's purpose was to serve God, to glorify God, to show forth the likeness of the appearance of God, the images of God who created him in tending the garden. But God had prepared very good for him. If you study the carefully selected words here, he was placed, that is set to rest in the garden, to work it, to take care of it. Whatever work he did was therefore described as his service to God. 
service to them. There's an important passage of scripture that, that I learned in the New Testament that takes this principle which starts in Genesis and applies it to our lives today. But in Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25, we read, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance for the Lord, from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. That is important to know to whatever in life you may find yourself turning your hand to. I know I've told you this story before, but briefly, I came out of the Air Force, sergeant, crew chief on a KC-135. I, I certified aircrafts and pre-flights that they were safe and they could do the mission. People's lives were in my hand. It was a job of responsibility. The Air Force trusted me with multi-million dollars of pieces of equipment. God called me a second time into the ministry, gave up a military career, Ended up where I couldn't work because of a medical thing that came up. College called me that I had previously applied for. Long story short, they said the door's still open. We kept all your fees. Come on down. We even have a married couple's apartment for you. The GI Bill gave us enough money to just barely live. And it, the school was free because I had been saved by a pastor who went to that school and had a recommendation from him to go to the college because I had saved in the Bible Baptist Church. So it was tuition free. And there were Pell Grants so we could live. So we sold everything we had except it fit in the 68 Camaro that I didn't even own. It was my wife's father had too many Camaros in his driveway. Gave me one to take to college. And Carrie was pregnant about a month from getting delivered our first baby. I think. Took off for Springfield, Missouri. Picked up a newspaper. Looked for the help on it. Dad's jobs were hard back then. Hard to find a job. There was one, a dishwasher, Sam Rose restaurant. 24-hour restaurant. I could wash dishes all night and go to school all day. You sleep when you're dead. <laughs> uh, right. So went off to college, ended up picking cigarettes. But the old days, you could smoke cigarettes in restaurants. Young folks don't know about that. You had to pick all the cigarette butts out of the bus, bus pants because they clog up the dishwasher. So here I am, former Sergeant Jesse Adams, picking cigarette butts. Clean and dirty dishes. There's a lot more of the story that I ended up being chief cook and bottle washer in the end. Uh, but it was not a very good restaurant to work for. But this first came to me. You don't work. I never worked for Sambo's. Although I had that job all the way, it carried me through college. You work for the Lord. He had you there for a reason. And I think I learned as much. Wash your dishes and about the people I worked with there in that restaurant that I ever learned in Bible college. That was the best part of the education. But know that, like Adam, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart is working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that you are serving. Verse 16 of Genesis 2 includes the first use in the Old Testament of, of, the, of the major verb for command. Command. God's first commandment to man concerned life or death, good or evil. And with all the rest of God's commandments, there were, as with all of the rest of God's commandments, there were positive blessings for obeying and negative, negative prohibitions, blessings and cursings for disobeying. All earthly goods and pleasures were at man's disposal except this one tree which was forbidden. I'm probably saying it wrong, but Eric was in Germany. We had these signs all over the base and everywhere. Verboten, right? Big red letters, German. Forbidden, verboten. So I've always got words stuck with me because I always saw these signs all the time. In fact, I think it was ISIS verboten. It is forbidden, okay? God says, everything is yours except this one thing. It is remote. It is forbidden. Verses 16 and 17 states the command in strong tense. Man can eat freely from the other fruit, but if he ate of this one forbidden tree, he would surely die. It was verboten. Still, he ate of it. I remember as a kid working on the farm, we used a lot of poisons back in those days that we aren't allowed to use nowadays. 
wasn't good for the environment. But they used to put on these cans that's, remember the old skull and crossbones? Any of you remember the old skull and crossbones? And the word poison between the two sets of skull? Yeah. You don't drink that stuff. You don't even touch it. It's poison. And yet what did they do? And we'll get more into the fall next time. God prepared mankind for a specific design in His image. Placed him in a garden, prepared for him, perfect environment so he could have no excuses. Gave him responsibility to work it, to take care of it. A single command with a warning, you're free to eat from the tree in the garden, but if you must, but but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. God set man in the garden to be an obedient servant, warning that before him was a way of life and a way of death, depending on whether they obeyed the commandment of God or not. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, again laying the foundation for the law and the rest of Scripture, God through Moses said, set forth for Israel all the instructions uh, that, 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 that are here in Deuteronomy 30. In, in verse 11, it begins, Now, what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you, or it's not too beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven uh, that you have to, to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it, or it be on the sea. So that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us that we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, to keep His commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter in and possess. This day I call heavens and earth as a witness against you. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to His voice and hold fast to Him for the Lord is your life. And He will give you many years in the land He swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were given the book of Genesis. Did they learn from them? Did they learn from their first parents? We are given the book of Genesis. We're also given the example of the nation of Israel. Have we learned anything from them? Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 through 13 says, All these things happened to them, to Israel, as examples and were written down as warnings for who? The church at Corinth, by application to us. Let's talk about the helper. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, uh, that was his name. He talks about taxonomy. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds, the sea, wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs, and then he closed it up, the place, with the flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and brought, and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He shall be, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now this portion of our text records the creation of the first woman and the institution of marriage right away. We get to the institution of marriage. It teaches much about the mainstay of Israel's society. You know what that mainstay was? Marriage and family. Family. Tribe. Nation. As goes the family, so goes the nation. God intended husband and wife to be a spiritually, to function as a unity, walking in integrity, serving God, keeping His commandments together. When this marital harmony is in operation, society prospers and is blessed under God's hand, and families thrive. 
and tribes thrive, and the nation thrives. Do I need to repeat that? When this marital harmony is in operation, society prospers under God's hands, and families thrive. Family has been under attack in America for a long time. We're seeing its destruction every day. The breakdown and destruction of family as God intended it. Why? Little three little words start to an S into an end. Sin and rebellion. Rebellion against what God has commanded us to do. Drifting away from God's teachings to man's choices. Men still deciding what's good and evil for themselves. Creating a disastrous mess that ends in the destruction of society and of a nation. In the New Testament, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all sexually immoral. It's New Testament. That's not Old Testament. Malachi 2, 13-14, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. What? You weep and wail because He no longer looks with favor on your offerings, or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. And you ask why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, your helpmeet. The wife of your marriage covenant has not the one God made you both? You belong to Him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard. And do not be unfaithful to the wife of yours. What does God say? Families. Families of faith. To carry the faith, the story from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. And of course, Ephesians 5, 25 through 6, 3. Husbands, love your wives. And Paul goes on in that passage. And I, I'm all convoluted here. I'm talking about Christ and the church. God's new family. In the new creation. And also important to the families. It goes on in Ephesians 6 after husbands and wives. Children. Obey your parents in the Lord. Uh oh. They weren't left out of this command. For this is right. Honor your father and mother. Which is the first commandment with a promise. So that it may go well with you. And that you may enjoy a long life. On the land. On the earth. God's plan for godly families being perpetuated. Adam was alone. That was not good. All else in creation was good. Verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, verse 25. All good. As man began to function as God's representative, naming the animals, representing his dominion over them, he became aware of his solitude. Being one of a kind is not necessarily being a good thing. God therefore put him to sleep, created Eve from his very own flesh and bone. God decided to make him a helper suitable, that is a helper corresponding to him, or a corresponding helper for the man. Helper is not a demeaning or a subservient term. In fact, that very word for helper is often used in Scripture to describe Almighty God. Psalm 33, 20. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our helper and our shield. Same word. Same root. Psalm 75, but as for me, I am poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O God. You are my helper and my deliverer. Lord, do not deliver. Psalm 119.9. All you Israelites, trust in the Lord. He is their help and she. This description of her is corresponding to him. means basically that what was said about, about it in Genesis 2.7 was also true of her. They both had the same nature. But what man liked his aloneness wasn't good. She supplied. And what she liked, he was supplied. Lastly, marriage and all that you Genesis 2, 24-25. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. We're thinking this is the foundation of the Bible. Because from here, this is the book of genealogies. What are we going to study? All the different families. Those that stayed on the path and walked with God and those who didn't. And do we learn from that? This is where man leaves his father and mother is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. 
The culmination of the two was one flesh. Complete unity. The man and woman in marriage before God. So Adam and Eve were spiritual unity, living in integrity without sin. If the words of verse 24 were spoken directly by God to Adam, we don't know for sure. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. The implication is that marriage involves one male and one female becoming one flesh. Jesus responding to the religionists of his day, the theologians of his day, in Matthew 19, 4 through 6, he says, haven't you read? By the way, where's Jesus quoting from? Where's he reading from? What we just looked at this morning. Haven't you read, he replied, that in the beginning, the Creator made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Marriage instituted and ordained by God, as the writer of Hebrews said, marriage should be honored by all. It was God's plan from the beginning, according to His Word. For the blessings and the story of the faith to pass through human families. Their nakedness suggests that they were at ease with one another, without any fear of exploitation or a potential for evil. Such fellowship was shattered later at the fall and was retained only in a major in marriage when a couple begins to feel at ease with each other. Here, their nakedness, though literal, also suggests innocence. In conclusion this morning, Paul referring to the lessons taught here in Genesis, creation story that we're studying, he preached in Athens, Greece, on Mars Hill, to the place called the Oropagus. He preached this sermon. The God who made the world and everything in it. Isn't it interesting that that is foundational? You've got to know that first. And everything else in Scripture is kind of built on that. We leave out the Old Testament. We leave out the context of the New Testament. Paul referring to the lessons taught here in Genesis. God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built by human hands. In fact, that's J.B. Phillips. That's because your God is too small. He is not served by human hands as if He needed anything. Rather, He Himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, that's Adam, by the way, He made all nations, all tribes and societies and families of the earth, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this. So that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He is not far from any one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, quoting from pagan poets. We are His offspring, even they know that. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. Now watch this. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. And He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. Uh-oh, we missed that part. We don't like to preach on that at Easter. You understand? As we get close to the Passion season, we get close to Easter Sunday, everybody loves to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. His resurrection is proof that there is a day of reckoning and a day of judgment. That's why God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. His resurrection is the proof of a judgment day. So repent and believe before it's too late. That's the lesson. As Jesus preached in Mark 1, verses 14 and 15, after John, that is the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. Jesus, the best gospel preacher who ever lived, was preaching the good news. Quote, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That's 
Jesus' command. And that's God's command <laughs> to our world, our world today. Let's uh, close with a, with a song this morning. Please stand and turn to number 12. Praise Him, praise Him.